When does human life begin? Adventist attitude towards human life. Author, Nick Samaluk, PhD. Narrator, Daniel Winters. Does life begin at birth? Does it begin at conception? Physiology books have always affirmed that human life begins at fertilization. For 2,000 years, physicians have recognized this and swore by the Hippocratic Oath which forbids abortion. The Traditional View Biology books have always taught that human life starts when the human ovum is fertilized. Catholics and Southern Baptists agree with this traditional teaching. Our Adventist pioneers shared the same view about the beginning of human life. The Southern Baptist Belief Resolution on the Freedom of Choice Act, Hyde Amendment, adopted at the SBC Convention, June 1993. Be it resolved that we, the messengers to the Southern Baptist Convention, meeting in Houston, Texas, June 15-17, 1993, affirm the biblical teaching that God is the author of life and that human life begins at conception. Psalms 51.5, 139.14-16, and Jeremiah 1.5. Does human life begin at birth? John V. Stevens, Sr. Christ valued choice over life. Every human being, created in the image of God, is endowed with a power akin to the Creator, individuality, power to think and to do. Education, page 170. This takes place after birth, when the developing baby becomes a person. By John V. Stevens, Sr., former Pacific Union Conference Public Affairs Religious Liberty Director, in Abortion Answers and Attitudes, Pacific Union Recorder, August 20, 1990. Does it begin before birth? Dr. Sean Pittman For me, the human function requires a brain that can process and appreciate and store the memory of sensations and feelings. Without this ability, the definition of being human has not been met any more than it has been met by my appendix or by the potential of an unfertilized egg and spermatozoon that have not yet met. The Potential Argument Dr. Sin Pittman The potential of being human is not the same thing as actually being human. At what point in its development does the unborn become human? No brain equals no human equals no murder. I don't think there is any doubt. The embryo, within the first few weeks of life, does not have a brain, no doubt. No brain equals no human. No human equals no murder. Simple. More from Dr. Sean Pittman. Intermittent electroencephalographic bursts in both cerebral hemispheres are first seen at 20 weeks gestation. They become sustained at 22 weeks and bilaterally synchronous at 26 to 27 weeks. Questions for Dr. Sean Pittman. Can you be a little more precise? Does human life begin at 20, 22, 26, or 27 weeks of gestation? At what precise stage of pregnancy does it become murder to kill the baby? Isn't seven weeks of a gray area a little bit too much? Would it make sense for President Obama to order the U.S. patrol agents to secure the borders and then tell them that the U.S. border lies somewhere between the 27th and 34th parallel? How could border patrol agents protect our borders on the basis of a fuzzy idea of where these borders lie? What is the significance of the fact that current technology can detect brain activity somewhere between the 20th and the 27th week of pregnancy? Can developing babies really think or make moral decisions at that stage? Is a just-born baby able to distinguish between right and wrong? When does human life begin? Dr. Shan Pittman It seems then, to me at least, most reasonable and consistent 
to define what it takes to be human by what it is that makes humans unique from other living things. The role of the human mind. That, for me, is the uniqueness of the human mind, the higher cortical brain function of the human mind. Therefore, until or unless such a brain has been formed, the definition of being human has not been met. Questions for Dr. Sean Pittman. If higher brain cortical function is a requirement for membership in the human family, is it morally right to kill a baby who does not meet this criteria? What about the comatose patients? Some have recovered their brain functions after, not nine months or less, but many years later. Dr. Gerald Winslow's Opinion The Church has chosen not to define the precise moment human life begins a moment science finds difficult to pinpoint. Quoted in broader religious input needed in stem cell debates as Adventist ethicists. Adventists admit their ignorance. Notice that while the Roman pontiff and the Christian Southern Baptists were declaring far and wide that human life begins at fertilization, we announced to the world that we did not know when human life begins. The Protection Enigma if we Adventists do not know when human life begins, how can we protect it? Can the President of the U.S. order patrol agents to protect our borders and then admit that we don't know where they are? Dr. Gerald Winslow's Opinion But the prenatal life we're protecting exists once an established pregnancy can be ascertained. Question: Does Dr. Winslow mean we should protect the unborn from the moment of conception? Viability Argument We admit, argued Dr. Winslow, that in the early stages of human development, we do not have a person in the full sense of the word, and not even immediately after birth. Nevertheless, the destruction of a fetus after the point of viability should raise serious concerns. What is so magic about the ability to survive? Questions for Dr. Winslow You said that prenatal life should be protected once pregnancy is verified. But you are saying now that serious concerns arise when the baby can survive outside the uterus. We get it. No serious concerns exist prior to the point of viability, right? Is this why we permit elective abortions? The Personal Autonomy Argument to this we must add that the established human life should take precedence over the pre-personal human life, and we should not forget the value of personal autonomy. Gerald Winslow, quoted in Abortion and Christian Principles, Ministry Magazine, May 1988, pages 12 to 16. What does autonomy mean? Autonomy, in fact, means self-rule. Does the Bible teach autonomy and self-rule? Isn't the pregnant woman subject to God's law instead of self-rule? Winslow's Nebulous Response Did we get a clear and unambiguous answer from Dr. Winslow? Does the pregnant woman really own her body and the body of the baby she is carrying? Did not Paul state that our body belongs to God? Traditional Views on Abortion What has been the traditional view of abortion? What did the early Christian church teach about the killing of the unborn? What did the Hippocratic Oaths state about this issue? What was their Adventist pioneer's view on killing the unborn? The Hippocratic Oath I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. The Christian Position The Dedeki The second commandment of the teaching, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not seduce boys, you shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not practice magic, you shall not use potions, you shall not procure an abortion, nor destroy a newborn child. Didaki 2, 1-2, A.D. 70 
The Catholic Position Christian writers from the first century author of the Didache to Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, The Gospel of Life, have maintained that the Bible forbids abortion just as it forbids murder. Mother Teresa's Belief But I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child, murdered by the mother herself. And if we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? The SDA Pioneers Teaching Adventists inherited from the Christian Church their attitude towards abortion and considered it as a violation of the Sixth Commandment. SDA pioneers were pro-life. James White, J. N. Andrews, John Harvey Kellogg, Ellen White, John Todd, and others were all pro-life individuals. Opinion shared by James White Many a man, who has as many children as he can support, instead of restraining his passions, aids in the destruction of the babes he has begotten. The sin lies at the door of both parents in equal measure. For the father, although he may not always aid in the murder, is always accessory to it, and that he induces and sometimes even forces upon the mother the condition which he knows will lead to the commission of the crime. James White quoted in Solemn Appeal, Battle Creek, Michigan, Steam Press, 1870, page 100. Ellen G. White and Abortion Ellen White was also pro-life, in spite of never having used the term abortion. Ellen G. White's Statements If the father would become acquainted with physical law, he might better understand his obligations and responsibilities. He would see that he had been guilty of almost murdering his children by suffering so many burdens to come upon the mother. Ellen G. White in Selected Messages, Volume 2 Published by Review and Herald Publishing Association, 1958 Pages 429 to 430. Ellen G. White and God's Law All acts of injustice that tend to shorten life or any passion that leads to injurious acts towards others or causes us even to wish them harm, all these are, to a greater or less degree, violations of the Sixth Commandment. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets Published by Review and Herald Publishing Association, 1958, page 316. Ellen White and Abortion Mrs. White never used the term abortion. She rather talked about almost murdering the unborn. What is the difference? Uriah Smith and Moral Issues Uriah Smith, long-term editor of SDA Publications, did not address the abortion issue directly, but he stated, must we be silent on abortion? You show me a church that fails to take a stand on political issues that involve moral principles, and I'll show you a church that is spineless, irrelevant, and morally bankrupt. No issue is too controversial for us to address and honestly in pages of our church paper. Uriah Smith, quoted in Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, quoted by P.A. Lorenz, Adventist for Life News, Volume 3, Issue 3 Adventist in Human Life What has been our traditional view of human life? What was our traditional view on self-defense? What had priority, lifestyle, or the value of human life? A pro-life hero The story of Desmond Doss He valued human life He refused to carry a gun he would not kill even in self-defense. He determined to keep the Sabbath. He was almost court-martialed. The soldier without a gun. The man who saved others. The man who dodged enemy bullets. The man who almost got court-martialed. The man who refused to act in self-defense. Was awarded by President Truman the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor. Truman stated on said occasion, at the end of his speech, I am proud of you, 
You really deserve this. I consider this a greater honor than being president. Quoting Bhutan Herndon, The Unlikeliest Hero, Civic Press Publishing Association, 1967, page 159. What is the current view of abortion? What is the current Christian view of abortion? What happened to our Adventist view about the killing of the unborn? What was the motivation behind our compromise on this issue? Baptist view of abortion Be it further resolved that we affirm the biblical prohibition on the taking of unborn human life except to save the life of the mother. Southern Baptist Beliefs Resolution number 8 on 30 years of Roe v. Wade, adopted at the SBC Convention, June 2003. Resolved, that we reaffirm our belief that the Roe v. Wade decision was an act of injustice against innocent unborn children as well as against vulnerable women in crisis pregnancy situations, both of which have been victimized by a sexual revolution that empowers predatory and irresponsible men and by a lucrative abortion industry that has fought against even the most minimal restrictions on abortion. The Catholic Church Dogma Human life is sacred because from its beginning it involves the creative action of God and it remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator, who is its sole end. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. No one can, under any circumstance, claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being. The Adventist Church's Views Neil Wilson, former GC and NAD president, publicly stated in 1970, Though we walk the fence, Adventists lean towards abortion rather than against it. Because we realize we are confronted by big problems of hunger and overpopulation, we do not oppose family planning and appropriate endeavors to control population. Neil Wilson's Statement Neil Wilson made this statement in 1970, three years before the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion. This means that the Adventist Church led the way for the killing of the unborn. Our Castle Memorial Hospital Our hospital in Hawaii started performing abortions on demand right away. The Role of Non-Adventists The move to offer abortions on demand was initiated by non-Adventist physicians at our Castle Memorial Hospital, CMH. These non-Adventist doctors threatened to take their patients elsewhere. The Adventist leaders caved in to the pressure from non-Adventists. Adventist Leaders' Motivation the fear of losing revenue led our leaders to compromise with the evil. The fear of the Lord was replaced by the fear of financial loss. The church leaders ignored Jesus' warning against serving God and money. God's warning was ignored. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? What does the believer have in common with an unbeliever? 2 Corinthians 6.14 Elective Abortions by Adventists The example set by our Castle Memorial Hospital was soon followed by at least five other Adventist medical institutions. The Hippocratic Oath, which forbade abortions, was set aside by Adventists. Thousands of innocent unborn babies were killed in our own hospitals. Source of Wilson's Statement George B. Gaynor, Abortion, History of Adventist Guidelines, Ministry Magazine, August 1991, pages 11 to 17. A moral question to ponder. Why is this baby whose tiny hand is grasping the hand of the surgeon considered less than human? Adventistarian Practice The Adventist practice of participation in the profitable abortion business is rooted in its nebulous doctrinal position. Our guidelines on abortion affirm that we do not condone abortions on demand. 
Then we looked the other way, while thousands of elective abortions were done at our own medical institutions. Straddling the fence, Jesus asked, Can someone serve two masters? Adventists said, Yes, we can please both pro-lifers and those in the pro-choice, pro-abortion crowd. That was what Pilate did. He declared Jesus to be innocent and ordered him killed. Additional Information For a more complete treatment of the Adventist Church and abortion, get a copy of my book, From Pro-Life to Pro-Choice, The Dramatic Shift of Seventh-day Adventist Attitude Towards Abortion. It is on lulu.com. Type my name, N-I-C space S-A-M-O-J-L-U-K in the blank search space to access the book's page. From Pro-Life to Pro-Choice A book documenting the Adventist moral compromise in direct violation of God's law and the Adventist's own guidelines on abortion. All for the sake of financial profit. A Pro-Life website for more information on abortion and related issues, try the following adventlife.wordpress.com This is my new interactive web page which will replace my previous ones sdaforum.com and letsfocusonlife.com A pro-life YouTube video Daniel Winters created a YouTube pro-life video worth watching. Here is an internet link to help you access this valuable video. Seventh-day Adventist Church and Abortion Video by Daniel Winters Petition aimed at Adventist leadership If you believe that it was wrong for our Adventist leaders to allow our Adventist hospitals to engage in elective abortions, Sign the following petition recently posted on the internet. Petition to stop and apologize for elective abortions in Adventist hospitals.